Welcome, Senator Starobin. Thank you for having me. Dot com. Uh, just a little bit for uh, people who might not know you in this district, in the newly created 17th New York State Senate District. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and why you're running. <coughs> well, I was born in the Soviet Union, and you know the Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Uh, that's when I lived in a very interesting time. and. Uh, you live through a fall of a nation, of what was regarded as an empire, uh, world power. You live through that and you kind of understand why politics is important. You understand why economics is important. You understand how it affects you directly. In particular, being Jewish, you're at the, on the front line of everything. Because before anything else went wrong, uh, one of the first things that began happening where I lived is that Jews began being targeted. Um, in 1989, on January 5th, my great uncle was murdered. Actually, not even murdered, but tortured to death after four hours of being tortured. He was 70 years old. He was a doctor. He was a regular person. Uh, my cousin, who was 16 at the time, was kidnapped. He ran away when they got drunk, but nevertheless, it was four days of him being tortured. Uh, there was a lot of people in my city who were Jewish who had to endure a lot of things like that. This was not something that targeted our family, this was something that targeted the whole Jewish community. And you kind of look at it and you realize that um, governments make a difference, that when there is a collapse you're on the front line of it and you will you will take the fall. Uh, economically as well as uh, in terms of safety as well as just how people treat you because uh, we were just uh, joking a second ago before we began uh, this interview but there is a viewpoint that uh, among some people that we Jews have all the money and that if somebody is struggling, well, we took that money. There's a Russian expression which rhymes in Russian, but the expression is if there's no water running in your faucet, it's because the Jews drank it all. Everyone knows this expression, by the way, in Russia. So uh, you kind of recognize that politics is important and you should participate in it. And coming what to is, the. Uh a uh, kind of feeling um, that uh, permeates a lot in the, the Russian Jewish community that uh, in response to their background that they come from Russia and, uh, and uh, ravages of communism and Stalinism um, the only way to go is uh, um, to fight socialism and not to have it coming here in the United States is to be Republican and conservative can you be an anti-communist Jewish person and be a liberal uh, uh, Democrat? Or is it impossible? Well, you could certainly be anti-communist and be a Democrat. There are many Democrats uh, who were very anti-communist historically. Scoop Jackson. Uh, there were many of them, obviously. John Kennedy. Um, that uh, It's obviously not the same thing to call someone a liberal and to call them a communist. Having said that, uh, from an economic point of view, uh, what we see around the world is the more an economy moves to the left, the worse it is, worse off it is in the long term. So Greece did not move as far as the Soviet Union, but to, uh, to, uh, to wasting money, to raising taxes. But Greece moved in that direction more than the United States did, and we yeah, see what happened in Greece. Trying to give us the same medicine that the Germans are trying to ram through all of Europe, especially in Greece or in Spain. We need austerity, we need to cut the budget, we need to cut health benefits. People are being thrown out of hospitals in Greece. Well, we certainly do not need to throw people out of, the, out of hospitals and that's why we need to make sure that we do not come to a point where we just can't afford to run the economy, where our debt is so huge that we have to make uh, changes that are just not reasonable. But um, what we need is to make sure that we do not spend more than what we bring in. Just like you and your household, how many a month can you not pay your credit card bill? How many months can you run up your credit card bill? If you spend every single month 20, 30, 40 percent more than you spent, than you earned last month, what will happen in half a year, a year, two years? You'll wind up sleeping on the street. That's what will happen. And then all of a sudden you don't have the most basic things. You can't all of a sudden buy food because your credit card bill suddenly is more than your uh, income for the month. Well, isn't the solution sometimes? As is in Europe, New York State is a liberal-run state, and uh, we have here a lower unemployment, um, as uh, there are many red states uh, that have uh, uh, very strict anti-union laws. 
there is no relation with, uh, with the health of a budget of a state, uh, or you might disagree. Um, when, uh, when we go uh, according to the Republican medicine for the economy in Alabama, Mississippi, is it better there? Well, obviously each state is going to be different, but we know uh, when we look at what medicine New York was taking, how New York responded. We know what happened under David Jenkins in New York. We know that 300,000 people left New York at the time, in the four years of David Jenkins. We know that our unemployment rate was consistently higher than the national one. We know that our schools were consistently worse, uh, public schools than the national performance. Cons and this was a consistent uh, thing. And then all of a sudden Rudy Giuliani comes in and the crime collapses and uh, tax or he brings taxes down all of a sudden the hotels uh, start to do better or we have more tourism all of a sudden the economy picks up or, you know and we saw a change in New York a very positive change to the Giuliani me medicine which was very different than the David Dinkins uh, medicine. We do obviously we want to make sure we protect all the people that need protecting. When I went to college, I got college grants. You know what, because I, there is no way that I would have been able to pay for it myself, but the reality is that the state of New York and the United States is better off for that because I got an education, I was able to pay taxes. So you look at certain spending as necessary. an investment. It's an investment and it's also necessary. For example, I sp the first thing that I sponsored in Albany was medical research. The next day I sponsored something that, uh, to get more funding for special needs kids. We can't be inhumane. We have to make sure that um, we treat people who are ill. That is a key thing. This is why the first thing that I sponsored uh, had to do with those things. So if New York State invests in, in research on, on, on medicine, shouldn't New York State have a right to tell the drug companies you can't charge so much? Or should they have a right to lobby Albany? Now you can tell us how much we will charge for medicine, as well, the Republicans uh, have it in, in Washington. I'll tell you a story about lobbyists. Um, the day that I got sworn in, um, I, was, I was sworn in at uh, 2.45 p.m. They told me to come at 9 o'clock in the morning so that they'll show me, you know, wh what's where. So I show up, it was probably 8.45, 8.50. I get into the secretary of the Senate's office. And, they, and I've never been to my own Senate office yet. Uh, I have not been sworn in, I'm not going to be sworn in for another six hours or so. Uh, I mean, I really, this is the first time that I'm walking in in any capacity. And um, the Secretary of the Senate goes, uh, you know, you should go to your office because uh, there's someone waiting for you. So I go there and there's a whole bunch of lobbyists standing there waiting for me six hours before I'm to be sworn in. You know, and then you, uh, when you walk into the Senate right before, there's a lobby. And they actually hang out there in that lobby. They're actual lobbyists, literally. So the, la the name lobbyists. applies. Like the name actually applies. They're sitting there in the lobby catching you uh, with their material, trying to give it to you. And one issue with that is that wealthy people can afford lobbyists. Poor people also have their advocates, very poor people like people. Uh, but that middle class, from lower middle class to upper middle class to everything in the middle, that person who makes anywhere between twenty and eighty thousand dollars a year, uh, he can't afford a lobbyist and he doesn't get any government help either. So the problem with that person is that he or she squeezed that uh, on the one hand they don't get help from as poor people, on the other hand they don't get help from their lo wealthy lobbyists. We don't need to limit their role, we don't need to make sure that uh, the people who are holding up this economy, the mom and pop bagel store, the guy who's going to work as a uh, you know, computer developer or something, the woman who's working as a nurse or a teacher, uh, we need to make sure that those people are, uh, are protected. You know, those, at the end of the day, those are the people who make the economy run. And those are our families. I mean, that's my mom. My mom is a social worker. That's my, you know, that's the rest of my family, other social workers, doctors, uh, uh, pharmacists, uh, that's who we need to, that's who we need to make sure that we protect and beyond that, um, like I said, education is a very important thing because uh, my parents got divorced when I was three and a half years old. My father is in Israel, my mother is here, I came with my mom. If I didn't get an education, I would not be able to make anything of myself. And we have a situation right now where on the one hand public schools are failing, 
On the other hand, the government is cutting aid, whatever aid was available for secular parts of education in private schools. Like, so for like math books, they only give about $50 for all the books combined a year. Each book costs $50, you can't uh, do it. Same for lunch programs, busing, everything else. And occasionally they'll throw a little bit of pocket change at us. But the reality is that they keep on cutting every program. There used to be an office for non-public schools in the governor's uh, office. We don't have that anymore because they cut that as well. We need to make sure that our education is such that people are able to move out of poverty, that and not that they're forced into poverty. Now that we uh, have uh, the special, you're running for the special super Jewish district, as it's known in the media. Now this district was uh, created to uh, to, uh, to give voice for the interests of um, Orthodox Jews who. Up to now, we're divided into many districts just to uh, and become a minority. Now, there was a conflict of um, if it's uh, feasible, if it's advisable to have a specialist, but it exists now, and you're yes. running for that. What do you perceive is the uh, specific interest of the Orthodox Jewish community? Well, there are multiple interests uh, there. The like I s I'm, I'll go back to the theme that I was just talking about is one major concern, which is education, which is why I sponsored the repeal of the Blaine Amendment, which is the amendment that, for all intents and purposes, makes school vouchers impossible. Uh, the reason that we need school vouchers, in particularly in this community, is that go everyone here pays taxes, but they can't send their kids to, they can't get any educational benefit out of their, uh, out of the taxes that they pay. And they can't, because they can't send their kids to a public school. Public schools today are $18,000 a year. What I'm, pro I'm proposing is that at least half of that amount, at least like $9,000 per student, be given to parents as an option to give to either, they have a choice, they can send their child to a public school or take the $9,000 and send them to a school of their choice. But you, you mentioned the Blaine Amendment, yes. which is a constitutional amendment yes. in many states, barring the state from giving yes. uh, for sectarian money for education. Um, I'm fully aware that it's extremely uh, difficult, if not impossible, to remove that Blaine Amendment. Is that your entire program? It's, a, it's not. It's just the first thing that I mentioned. But let me just answer this, and then I'll mention, obviously, other things. Because I did sponsor about 42 laws um, when I was in Albany, and I intend to work on other ones as well. Um, so, let me put it this way. Let's look at how many bills out there nobody ever thought would be possible to pass. On the right and on the left. On the right, we're talking about, let's say, welfare reform. That the first time somebody spoke about it was when Patrick Moynihan created the Moynihan Report in the 1960s. It was not passed until the 1990s. So if somebody had given up in 1988, we would still not have it passed, right? On the left, we had something else. We had marriage redefinition. If I came to you in, during the last election, 2010, and I told you that unless we elect more Republicans, that uh, you know, you need more than a majority of one, which is essentially what we had last time, because you can always have one or two people split. Um, unless we elect more Republicans, we're going to have marriage redefinition. People would look at me like I was a crazy person. During the last election, if I had said that, it, I would have been, uh, you know, scaring people. I would have been fear-mongering, right? And what happened? They passed it. Who would have ever thought that it would pass? Everywhere you go, every referendum, regardless of the background, religious, ethnic, uh, it always gets uh, voted down. In the most liberal states, like California, still gets voted down. Look at school vouchers. We, in every poll, the majority supports it. Not just Jewish people, Catholic people, African American people, Hispanic people, Asian people. Across the board, we have a majority of people. Most of the people sitting with me in the Senate, and most of the people sitting with me in the Assembly, who do have to run for office every two years, uh, do represent districts where the majority support school vouchers. So how does, the, how does this work? On the one hand, they can't go against their majority because they know this would be a very popular program. On the other hand, they don't want to go against school unions who give them money because nobody wants to refuse money. So what do they do? They just come out and they say, look, I am for it. I am all in favor of school vouchers. I am the good guy here. But the only reason I'm not doing anything 
is because all the other people here are bad and they would never let it pass. And then you go to the next table over and he says the exact same thing. Well, I am the good one, he is the bad one. The next one over says, I am the good one and those two are the bad ones. Because that's a game that they play so that they can get union uh, money and at the same time make it uh, look like they actually support vouchers because the reality is that they have to support something that the majority of the people in the district support. But there's another... Um some, some activists, there's another reason why some activists believe that it's a pipe dream and a waste of political capital of the Orthodox community. If we're going to have a representative, their argument is that wherever uh, school vouchers have been approved, they have only been approved if, um, if they come with restrictions that, uh, that comply with uh, non-discriminatory rules, that the school has a minimum curriculum, do you think the Hasidic schools, especially in this neighborhood in Bora Park, which is part of this new district, will be able to comply, to uh, to qualify, to pass the constitutional muster, uh, to have these vouchers uh, um, being deemed kosher? Uh, well, obviously we need to look at the language. But like with any other bill, if you're passing any bill in the world, uh, transportation, crime, uh, education, anything, you know, at a federal level, the foreign policy, anything, you have to look at the language of the bill. If the language is such that it doesn't actually help the people, there's no value to that bill. But to say that we're wasting our time is no different than everyone else in, with previous bills that I mentioned. Uh, would be uh, wasting their time. Every time there is a bill that never been pa that's never been passed, everyone says it's a waste of time, regardless of whatever the bill may be. Uh, I remember when I began running for office last time, there was one person, Sam Klieger, who was a refusal in the Soviet Union, who was fighting against that regime and fighting for the, rights of, for the right of the Jews to live. He wrote an article for me and everyone was saying that I have no shot to win, that I could never win, and that's it's a suicide mission to support me because you'll just upset uh, this uh, about to be Senator uh, Lou Fiddler. So what's the point? And he wrote, uh, you know, that's what they told us in the 1980s, uh, in the early 80s when I became refusing. Like that they said, why are you fighting? All you're doing is you're destroying yourself, you're destroying your family, destroying your relatives and friends. What's the point uh, to this? And then as soon as we, the refusing, broke down the wall, all the other people went, oh yeah, that's a horrible, horrible state, the Soviet Union. You, you were right all along, I always agreed with you. But all throughout, they kept on telling us, it's a waste, why are you doing this? Just say good things about the Soviet Union. So you do have high hopes for vouchers to come forth and in the near future, the foreseeable future, that's going to be of actual use to the ultra-Orthodox community. In, um, I'll tell you this, every day that I was there, almost every day that I was there, there was a liberal group of people who would show up in Albany and scream, literally scream about something that they support. I have yet to see somebody from the Jewish community do the same thing because the reality is that our politicians have failed us. It can't be done, it, and it wasn't done with other groups uh, by, you know, regular person who is a teacher and his wife is a nurse, they went out and they got and they organized the bus load. It has to be elected officials who know where to take people, how to organize. They they have to take the lead in this. If nobody comes to Albany, it's not a problem. That's how it's perceived. The same thing in Washington DC, the same thing in the City Hall. If nobody fights, it's not a problem. If somebody comes in every single week, eventually something happens. And in particular, this is a very popular program. We had all sorts of things that people asked for that would be of no relevance to anyone outside of a very small group of people. This is something that is interesting to everyone between here and Buffalo and the Canadian border. Okay, you, you ask people uh, and overwhelmingly except those who are running school unions because they don't want to lose their uh, labor union dues people are in favor of this. The reality is that no matter what community you go to, if you come up to any mother or any father and you go, uh, who do you think should choose the education that your child gets? You or some bureaucrat God knows where? The, all of them will go, me. All of them. You mentioned uh, um, welfare reform and what the Republicans proposed. Now, I assume you, su you support um, Romney's presidency and his campaign. Um, the Republicans, um, it was President Reagan who said, we have to stop welfare as we know it. 
and the best way to lift a person up is tell them, go get yourself a job. If you have children at home and you don't have enough money, well, we'll give you tax credits for each child. Well, just last week, uh, we hear uh, from the secret uh, recording that you become a taker if you work hard. You just can't make your ends meet. A lot of people in our community find uh, that at the end of the year, the child tax credit is a great ben benefit. Do you support President Romney in cutting and uh, proposing to cut those benefits for families who have more than two, four, five, six children? Well, President Romney does not speak for me and I don't speak for President Romney, so the statements that he make are obviously unrelated to what I believe unless... I've said that I agree with him. Uh, the reality is that a lot of people do need help. And like I said, I received help when I went to college. I received government grants for me to be able to go to college. And other people may need different kind of help. And if it's temporary help or if it's the kind of help that people who are good, hard-working families, who may have lost their job, uh, or who may have found a job that is part-time or low-paying or something, and they're trying to make ends meet, we should not be a cruel, inhumane society that tells people, I don't care about you. Because if somebody had said that to me when I was a child with a single mother, uh, I would not be a senator right now, I would not be a lawyer right now, I would probably be homeless somewhere. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that the system is not being abused, that uh, when we have uh, somebody who uh, refuses to get a job and just... Uh, Our tax credit is one for people working. Working That's a different thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking. I'm talking about some uh, other type uh, types of uh, welfare where uh, people may stay on welfare for decades um, without well, trying to get a job. Welfare reform, but now exactly. we have the Republicans criticizing even the reform. So well, we need reform on reform. Well, it's not all Republicans. It's uh, and like I said, every Republican doesn't speak for me, just like every Democrat doesn't speak for my opponent. Uh, certainly, I have my view, my own points of view. We have to be well, a humane. You criticize Obamacare, right? What is it? Obamacare. Yeah. Um, so, which part would you keep? Uh, Pre-existing conditions? Will you still force um, the state will be administering most of these programs? So there will be an exchange. The, the, um, the government of New Jersey, the governor says he doesn't want to set up an exchange. Do you support New York setting up an exchange? Do you or do you, do you support that uh, the state of New York should spend money uh, on its part in support of what needs to be supported in Obamacare? Uh, do you support pre-existing conditions? Should uh, people who have pre-existing conditions should have a right to insurance? Uh, which part of Obamacare do you think should, should go down as far as the state is concerned? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, I've seen uh, government run health care in the Soviet Union uh, where you get uh, Anything that government, the government runs there winds up being a line in the shortage. When was the last time you went to the DMV without standing in line? When was the last time you had anything that you needed from the government without the government uh, making you wait, without the government having a shortage? It's just about everything. The government is generally speaking non-responsive because they do not have to compete for people's, uh, for people's uh, approval. Meaning that if you go to a store to buy yourself a pair of pants, if they're rude to you or if they don't have the kind of pants that you want, you go to the next store and you buy it there, right? If you go to the New York State DMV and they do not provide a proper service, you can't go, well, now I'm going to the Montana State uh, DMV. Oh, Montana doesn't do it well, now I'll go to the Belgian State D uh, to the Belgian government DMV. I don't know what they call it in Belgium. So you can't, you can't really do that. You're stuck with the government. And they realize it, and th for that reason, they have no incentive to, uh, to help you. Um, and as a result, the government is inherently and tremendously inefficient. I mean, I don't care what state you're talking about. I don't care what nation you're talking about. You go any place in the world. And I mean, I remember in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, you would go to the private market where they would sell, would sell fruits and vegetables so and everything. Would you compare com Medicare on on Medicaid to the Soviet system of health benefits? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, there, there are exceptions where you have to provide it to people. 
obviously if somebody is no longer physically able to work, which elderly people are not, which disabled people are not, somebody has to step in and the obvious uh, people to step in for that are, is the government. So for the poor people, for the disabled people, for the elderly people, we have to do that. Um, because there's no one else, there's no one else who can so do that. Incidentally, that? The, reje the rejection rate for almost any disease, for rejecting paying for something, is higher for Medicaid and Medicare than for private insurance companies, which people don't realize it because the government is always, uh, or politicians, are always attacking private insurance companies, oh, big business, business, big insurance. Well, guess what? The big public insurance actually rejects people more, significantly more, than the private one. Um, what we need to do is uh, we need to create something that will allow for more competition. Just like we allow for more competition. Like exchanges? Uh, exchanges are good, as well as uh, less regulation, just inviting more companies, making the environment such that pe companies feel like this is a good place for us to do business in. Not just healthcare and stuff, but everything else. Because like, like with anything else, you have a shoe store, a shoe store opens next door, all of a sudden the first shoe store has a yeah, sale. All the private insurance companies support the Obamacare. Of course they do, because what, they, what the government does is that they bring in more people in there, they force them to pay a certain amount of money, they don't actually have to compete with each other because they all have a government-run trust essentially. So of course they do. But what will happen is that they will wind up overcharging people. Instead, if you have a more of a free market system, they have to compete with each other. All of a sudden, Blue Cross and Blue Shield has to compete with the um, HIP or, and with uh, some other company. And, they, and how do you compete? Like with anything else, you provide a better service or you provide a cheaper service or you do something that people prefer to come to you than to someone else. Like with any other business, with a law office, with a medical uh, the doctor's office, a shoe store, anything. How do you compete? You know, that's how you compete. When you don't have to compete, you know, you get that uh, Soviet uh, government attitude. Uh, uh, you know, uh, remember uh, in the Soviet Union when the first American stores began to open? Uh, people would just stand in line, stores, restaurants, anything. People would just stand in line to go there. People were like, are they really that desperate for some ridiculous thing that they might be selling there? And then I remember somebody who went to, uh, in Moscow, because uh, that's where all the stores were originally. Uh, they came back and they said, that, you know, I went to that store just so I can walk in and have somebody say, hi, how can I help you? You know, and uh, because for once you would walk into a store and somebody would be nice to you. Oh, well, we're living in a, in a, in a time here in, uh, in, uh, in America where people of all backgrounds are accepted. And then there is more openness to the people of different backgrounds, but still we have a certain amount of voters who like to vote people who are of them more than people who are for them. Uh, f for the plurality of the Orthodox voters, would you say you're of them or for them? I would say it's both. I mean, I was raised three blocks away from here. We're sitting on 54th. I was raised on the same avenue on 57th. You go, you walk three blocks over as the crow flies, and uh, you know that's where I was. That's where I lived for 10 years. Before that, I lived in Flatbush. Before that, I lived in Borough Park again on 18th and 48th, uh, the Jewish parts of Flatbush. Um, I do think that I understand this community. I do think that my family has paid a severe price. Uh, to remain Jewish because a lot of people did bribe somebody to put down in their documents that they were not Jewish. My family, nobody did that. In fact, uh, when my father was 23 years old, 1967, he went out and he got a bris. Uh, when he was a child, um, because of his mom's job, uh, she was a manager of a winery, uh, the communists would come in to make sure to come to his school or to his kindergarten before that he didn't have it because otherwise his mom would get fired. And uh, when he was an adult, he made a conscious choice to do that. And I know that this is not surprising. This is not uncommon, obviously, for people to do it in Borough Park. But it's a different sacrifice in the 1967 Soviet Union versus the 2012 or 1967 United States. It's just a very, very different sacrifice to make. Um, and the, just in general, just declaring yourself as a Jew uh, was a was a sacrifice. I mean, the word Jew was repeatedly used as a very negative word. I mean, to this day, I have a little bit of a 
punch in the nose kind of feeling when I used the Russian word for Jew just because it was you would even when they didn't say anything to your face you would hear people speak and they would use the word Jew in a very negative uh, sense have you had uh, contact with the leadership of the, of the community of the yeshivas of the institutions and uh, have you heard any feedback of, on, the, on what they would like to have legislatively in Albany past and um, what are your perceptions well, I certainly have met uh, with a lot of people, and uh, as you know, the last election we had dozens and dozens of uh, the most uh, prominent Rabbonim endorse my candidacy. Um, I've met uh, with Rosh Hashivas, you know, with a lot of um, different types of leaders and um, of all uh, different types of organizations. Um, so, like I said, there my. Uh, the bills that I've sponsored dealing with uh, everything from education to transportation to uh, to crime uh, to um, uh, funding of uh, schools before vouchers are uh, are an option to um, you know medical needs of the com that are relevant uh, to New York State in general, but to this community in particular. Um, those are things that all reflect uh, the wishes and desires of the people of the community because the reality is that this is why you are there and uh, as a new center, as somebody who wants to make sure that he is accepted and uh, I do want to make sure that I do a good job, it's very important to me. But you your know, uh, campaign is showing less uh, funds raising from the community. Mostly your, I think that's what's reported, that most of your support is coming from specifically from the Russian community? No, we've had a lot of people in the from community uh, donate to us. I mean, Nachman Kohler has been very generous. Um, Ziggy Brach has been very generous. A lot of people have been very, very generous to us uh, with both their time and their money or in-kind services. In-kind services meaning if they provide cars or office space or anything like that, that's uh, an in-kind service. So a lot of people have been very, very generous um, in every community, incidentally, in the district. Uh, you have to understand that uh, they may call this district whatever they may call it, but we have to represent everyone. So Catholic population deserves representation as well. Uh, every other po type of population. If you're in the district, you walk into my office. There's no form, let me find out what's your background. You have to fight for every single person uh, in the community. And you know what? A lot of times the needs are not that dissimilar, like I said, with vouchers, with helping small businesses. Who's against helping small businesses here? You know, which community does not have small businesses? You know, you walk on 18th Avenue, and as you walk from 18th Avenue in the Borough Park area into 18th Avenue in Bensonhurst, do you not see businesses, small businesses there that are more or less the same? You know, a shoe store here, a shoe store there, a bakery here, a bakery there. You know, this one is oriented a little more to this community. This one is oriented to more, a little bit more to that community. But when it comes to tax policy, when it comes to government regulations, when it comes to whether the government will provide um, some kind of sponsored or uh, subsidized government uh, loans to small businesses, it doesn't matter which part of 18th Avenue you're on. So you do have to fight for every single person, regardless of um, what their background is. Do you consider yourself an underdog in, the, in this race? You come to the United States with a single mom as a child, you always consider yourself as an underdog. I mean, you go back 20 years ago today, in the, let's say the summer or the fall of, uh, what is it, 1992. You know what I was doing at the time? I was trying to make a little bit of money instead of, because I didn't have any allowance or anything like that. I would go look through garbage cans at festivals or at other places or where people would play basketball and look for soda cans. And then I would give them into, you know, different uh, places where you can get five cents a soda can. Uh, I don't think that too many people uh, seeing me uh, elbow deep in a garbage can thought, well, this guy's going to be my center someday. I don't think that that thought ever occurred to anyone in the district. Um, and then just going forward yeah, with, any, with everything else, it's... Well, I've always been... Now that a little bit more of a, a softer and gentler conservative. Is it because of your background or is it because in this community um, conservative economics is not going to sell you f that far? Well, this has been my position, uh, pretty consistent position for, for a very, very long time. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's my background. Uh, I mean, uh, what am I supposed to say? I, I got something, now let's close the door to everyone else. Like when I needed help, 
but with college grants, like I got it, and now let's shut the door. I'm not giving one cent to anyone else. So help only for me and not for anyone else. Like how is, it would be just dishonest and hypocritical of me to do that. Having said that, I use my help to promote myself and to, you know, become a productive member of society. Hopefully, hopefully people view it that way. Um, but um, I, d I try to do my best not to just get it and then relax. Uh, and that's how I see things. If people are trying to better themselves and to help their family, that's one thing. If people are trying to abuse the system, to rig the system, it's another thing. And uh, as far as what kind of economics would work in this district, guess what? In this district, people also understand 13th Avenue and even 14th Avenue, and certainly 16th and 18th and, and a lot of other blocks, Fort Hamilton Avenue 12. A lot of small businesses. And guess what? In this district, people do pay their taxes. You know, all the people, they, they have a lot of the same concerns. They do understand that for us to be able to provide the help that the sick or the old or the young or the poor need, we need to have a functional quality economy. And if we don't have that, if everything goes down like it went down in the Soviet Union, nobody gets anything. My grandparents did not get their pensions. My grandfather fought through World War II, was injured multiple times, came back almost deaf, with badly injured feet. I mean, losing five brothers as soldiers in World War II. And apparently he didn't deserve a pension. He worked the whole time. He came back and immediately he worked from that point until he was almost 70 years old. And then the economy collapsed. And then they went, oops, we don't have any money. We need to have a good functional economy. Whether you are paying taxes or you're getting help right now, unless that pizzeria on 50th and 18th near the place where I lived, or any other place, unless they're making a profit, none of us can get anything that we need. Sanis Trobin, it was a real pleasure having you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming. Same here. Thank you.